for the purpose of the audience, um, quick introduction. The first session of the day is a panel discussion, and it's focused on adapting and embracing change in the midstream for survival in the new energy era. So, it, I mean, it goes without saying, very excited to have everyone here today. Um, we'll hope you find it an, in an interesting discussion. Um, I've spoken to these guys on and off, and based on yesterday's interaction and all the discussions that we've had, I really do believe that there'll be some exciting nuggets that you can gain. Um, so I'd like to introduce each of the panelists. So firstly, we have Johan Kalat, who's the chief executive officer of the Russian, the senior director for digital transformation and business transformation, Delec US, and Bijou Misery, who's director of corporate business transformation and automation for Enbridge. And welcome, Bijou. Uh, Bijou. <laughs> Sorry, mate. No, that's fine. No problem. Glad, glad to see you. Glad that you got on. Um, so I was just, just doing a very, very quick in introduction. So uh, just, just for the purpose of everyone that's, um, that's watching the session. So it's just a quick reminder that all attendees, you've joined in this anonymous mode, so you're completely muted. But there are areas within the system that I'd encourage you to use. So in the, the right-hand side, there's a Q&A uh, tab. Um, if you have a question for the panel, or you'd like me to ask the panel, just drop your question in the Q&A box, and we can pick them out, and we can read them through and, and answer them. Um, other than that, I guess we'll just kick things off, um, jump straight into it. So um, perhaps to start with, maybe we can give a quick overview, um, j just a little bit of background about who you are, what your role is, and maybe just some insights into um, why you're passionate about this topic and, and what you've been focused on. And, and perhaps we'll start with, uh, with, with you, Karthik. Sure. Uh, thanks, Mark. So, um, Karthik Shinimasen, my, uh, my background is mainly on the automation. I've been in the energy industry for almost two decades now. Uh, spent uh, a good amount of time in pipelines, midstream, downstream, and retail and other areas. So uh, I'm, I'm passionate about this area because I've been involved in the field, I've been involved in the office, I've been involved in the corporate, trying to set it up from ground all the way up to the strategic level. Um, the, 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 look, the time we are in is actually an interesting journey uh, for everybody. Uh, in terms of advancement in technology and how things are positioning in terms of how uh, pipeline industry is being seen and the oil and gas is seen and we have been challenged in terms of technology. So uh, definitely looking forward to the discussion and uh, this is my passion as a digital transformation. Uh, this is what I do day in and out every day at work. Fantastic. And how about you next, PG? Yeah, my name is Vijay uh, Mishra, so I work uh, for Enbridge. Uh, part, of my, <clears throat> part of my role is around uh, automation, so I run an automation CRE, mostly right now focus on process automation, then kind of expanding from there. I've uh, been in this industry probably about 15 years or so now, uh, but background kind of spans a whole bunch of other industry verticals. Mostly focus on large scale delivery, operational excellence, and automation. And yeah, how could you not be interested in this topic today? I think it's an industry in change. Uh, there are a lot of things that are happening, all sorts of different forces. There's probably the oil and gas industry, probably one of the unique ones that is having a whole bunch of things happening all at the same time. Uh, and everybody's trying to you know, manage it and add that, add pandemic to it. I mean, if, if there was ever a time for disruption and change and how we're going to operate, I think this would be it. Because this won't be the first and it's not the last either. I think there are many things like this that will occur. So yeah, that's right. Fantastic. And over to you, Johan. Uh, Johan Tomat, um, spent my most recent years as an energy entrepreneur, um, focused on the midstream side and um, always, uh, well, starting businesses from scratch, working with private equity. So I'm sitting more on the energy side, but I have a early career in uh, development, technology development, software and hardware. So I bring that with me wherever I go and have uh, throughout the, the process recognized the efficiencies that and efficiencies led by really accuracy and speed of delivery. 
to the customer and the organization of data. So uh, everything I do in the midstream space is has got a tech slant to it. Um, my focus has really been on the gathering side, oil, gas, and water, as well as um, uh, the trading, the, the buying and selling of crude. So wrapping all of that in technology wherever I can, just to, quite frankly, avoid mistakes and be able to answer customer questions faster, if not real time, and deliver that same information throughout the throughout our partners and internally. So it's it's always given me a competitive advantage being able to do more with with less, leveraging technology that way. But in everything we do, accuracy and safety and all those things are so important because you're dealing with with oil and gas and you're dealing with uh, large dollar figures, um, sometimes with very slim margins. So a very small mistake and very quickly have a very large impact on your bottom line. And that's primarily where I've been focused on, on the technology side, both in developing online platforms and then just measuring everything I can everywhere. So very excited about this topic. And like we just said, so many things are changing so fast. It's, it feels like you're on a roller coaster right now, both on the bad side with some of the hacks we've seen, but also on the good side with new technologies yeah. coming out that can do more and more and trying to leverage. Fantastic. Well, clearly a hell of a lot of experience here. So it should be a, a great discussion. And I think, you know, to, to kick things off, and um, I asked this question yesterday in the, uh, in the upstream um, session, and I think it's a good way to, to start this one as well and, and see, see how that compares. But um, Biju, you mentioned about the pandemic. I mean, clearly the pandemic has had a huge effect on the world, um, not just on the oil and gas industry, but every industry. Um, so perhaps to, to, to set the scene, maybe you can talk a little bit about what, what did you see as the biggest impacts at the start of the pandemic? Sure. How has that changed? And what are the big challenges now and into the future? And I, I realize it's quite, quite a broad question. Um, sure. So if you can keep it nice and, and concise, that would be great, right. um, <laughs> but it's all valuable information, right? So yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think it was a couple of things. Uh, how was it at the start? I think it was a shock to everybody. Uh, as I don't think this industry is immune to it. Is how do you operate um, in a kind sort of distributed environment? In addition, knowing that there is field work that continues, that would you know customer connection that that would still continue. So you have health and safety employees in the field, and I think. People have done a phenomenal job of, of doing that. And then making sure all the back office stuff is working in a distributed environment to make sure that everything keeps working. So that was the first thing. A lot of the focus on business continuity and disaster recovery, all those things that people just, in, in general, I think, everybody thought, oh, why do we do that? I, I think all that came out. And I think that's one of the biggest things that's come out is more continued focus on those kinds of things, making sure that, that those plans are there, people know how it works. In that process, yeah, you went remote. Half the workforce went remote immediately. Uh, I think that identified some process issues and gaps along the way as you try to run all the back office systems and processes that perhaps was easier. Uh, and uh, as a result of it, uh, I think we've gotten better in general as an industry. I think we realized that there are certain things that maybe were broken that we just didn't know because people worked together and it was easy to do that. Uh, so that's what I would say. And I think that's going to change. Uh, that's going to stay. You know, there's some things like customer interactions. If you're in the field, it's kind of difficult to do remotely. You essentially have to go and do actually work or you have to work on assets on the ground. It's kind of difficult to do that remotely, right? So safety and integrity and, and, and to uh, Elon's point, you know, that balance of risk, cost, and performance, I think from an asset management perspective, I think came into light really well. And I think industry at large, I think it responded really well. Because look at how many incidents have you really heard about? In this whole exercise of the last 18 months, how many things have you have you heard that have gone kaboom and people have died? And that speaks to how the industry has responded. I that's phenomenal. Yeah. Okay. So, so before before I ask um, Johan and, and Karthik uh, the, same, the same question, um, how did you see things, how did you see your priorities shift? Because 
obviously digital transformation, automation technology, the strategy has been there for a long time. You know, people have been going through um, sure. you know, technology implementation and looking at technology yeah. to, to fix certain things. But yeah, when at the start of the pandemic, I'm sure that there were certain technology strategies that you had in place. This how one. did you? How did that shift, and how did how did the priorities change? Did they, did yeah, so, projects start to accelerate? Yeah, so I think priorities, you know, was always around safety, integrity, and safety of employees. I think that remained constant, which is always first and foremost. When it comes to transformation and a change of technology implementations, yeah, I think we we sped it up, and priority gave, came to things that enabled employees to work. Uh, in a collaborative fashion in a distributed environment and even when and I think there was more embracing of some of those changes for employees because it actually be, was cumbersome in general there's a lot of things that were just difficult to do you know if you're not in the office and uh, I think people embrace that saying yeah if that's going to make my job easier you know why wouldn't I do it and automation is one of those examples where it just I have more uh, requirements now or more pull now on automating a lot of the manual things that we were doing only because of the fact that it eliminates all this manual work. Plus it also drives business continuity and resiliency in that way. Plus it's just good for employees. You know, it's, so that's what we saw was an uptick and that's how prioritization happened. Did it make, you know, did it help manage that risk, cost and performance? Did it drive employee engagement and capability? And did it drive collaboration? Like those are probably the three things that I would say. Okay. Yeah. And. Um... Perhaps we'll perhaps we'll move to to Johan. The same, I suppose, the same two questions. Probably more than two questions wound in there somewhere. But um, <laughs> over to you, Johan. Uh, I think the main impact from COVID is, um, like we just said, it's shifting to keeping operations just going in a distributed model. Um, we we were lucky and unlucky, I guess, by being small and new and. I mean, I had 10 people to deal with, with Bijou has a huge infrastructure and existing stuff where for us to shift systems is relatively quick and easy, right? So, and we we only put our systems in place over the last one, two years. So just by that mere fact, we're, we're on most likely more modern systems um, just because we're new. Uh, not, so uh, I, I'd say that that was the first thing is just figuring out how to automate pieces of the of, of of the business and the money flow and everything it, it goes through if you think about midstream it goes from the asset which of course is primary but also up to just the business systems right like accounting for stuff and who's writing checks and who's filing permits and who's filing reports and things like that when you're in a distributed model so from my seat it was ho look, trying to first and foremost just keep operations going um, in this environment. And then secondarily, we had in the midstream space and our space in the gathering space and continue to have tremendous changes on the contract structure side where there's been some bankruptcies and fallouts from those bankruptcies that has impacted the way people look at the security behind midstream assets. So not so much automation discussion, but the, in addition to dealing with all the tech and operations and systems, we have been as an indirect result of COVID, which caused some upstream bankruptcy, really had uh, to deal with massive changes in just the way we do business and price deals. Um, of course, we have platforms and systems that use those contract structures to automatically price deals for us. So that all has to be changed and updated. And it really starts with thinking about your business first and say, okay, given that this is the new new reality, whether it's people working distributed or suddenly the way we do business from a contracting piece have changed and implementing that very quickly throughout your support systems has been really the focus. And then uh, I'd say there's been some unexpected opportunities as well, especially on a crude oil marketing side with oil going negative and back to what almost $70 now in the US and um, that has also allowed us to do some larger and different kind of uh, transactions than we would normally do. And same thing, having to on the fly in a distributed model, change our systems to be able to accommodate those. So I'd say for us, that has been 
it's been both good and bad where one part of our business has almost screeched to a halt due to some contracting so but another part of our business has seen some unexpected upside and adjusting your systems to accommodate that fantastic and um how about you Carthy? um actually uh, um what i would say is in the oil and gas sector uh, midstream actually was is positioned well um compared to the uh, downstream or the upstream and the reason i say that is Midstream, they operate the pipelines or we operate the pipelines uh, from a remote location. So that's actually already a step up uh, compared to the upstream or the downstream uh, area. So um, what we actually run into is, so I had, I mean, um, in my role, I have the opportunity to go downstream, midstream and uh, retail and uh, look at the well. So what we have done is uh, accelerated the efforts, much like everybody, what um, uh, Johan and uh, Biju shared. Uh, key areas I would say targeted where one is uh, something I, um, in the permit to work or operated around, we started looking at it on a digitalized way. So we have to send folks or the operators at every location day in and out for these uh, um, routine inspection and maintenance. There are a lot of data that now using uh, smart systems are actually coming in at your, um, at your uh, dispersal, like either in a web app or any sort of a system. So now it has actually changed the way we approach it. Say you don't have to go and take a reading of a, a, a sensor or, or an instrument. You actually get that one real time and it actually forced us to look at it differently and cost efficiently, not go in traditional methodology of putting in uh, those sensors and increasing the cost, going in wireless and uh, on the other areas. So that's one. The other one, uh, I think um, I like what uh, Johan touched on is the contracts. So the, the contract, there's a huge uh, wave that's coming up and it's gonna be more in, in coming years uh, is on the digital contracts, especially with the blockchain uh, area. That's we, especially in oil and gas, we barely scratch that surface. Uh, and uh, we do come across a lot of these uh, companies have actually started looking at that and that's going to put a network where a contract that's actually digitalized and put in a system like blockchain system, it's going to it's going to remain and it's going to be a transaction that's going to be much easy to validate over a long run. Versus, uh, I think when we go do those trading, um, we have to go back do the back casting. We got to look at what was actually committed versus what we spent, what we what was delivered, what was what is the error. We got to look at all those manual ca calculations. We also have some of those spreadsheets, like most of the companies where we do some in spreadsheets. So I think those are the advancements we were forced into. Uh, and quite honestly, now we are looking at it more efficiently, not for the sake of technology, but then the how technology can add value. So at the end of the day, the data is actually getting more and more powerful now versus now that every information that every operator and every engineer that have done over the last 20 years is actually getting transmitted to an analytic way and embarking us, us in that journey. Uh, we, seem to have, uh, we seem to have lost Bijou. I don't know if he's uh, behind the scenes, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep going. Um, so great to, great to have that sort of overview and, and understand what the challenges have been and where things have, have led to. So I guess, Let's, if we move on to, I mean, it's a technology event, right? So we should be talking as well about specific types of technology. So perhaps we look at, um, you know, the operational excellence side of things and you know, efficiency, cost reduction. Um, what types of technology have you seen or have you, if you, if you implemented, um, to contribute to meeting these objectives? So what, what types of technologies have you, started looking at or implemented to achieve those cost drivers, the cost reduction, operational efficiency. Um, and if you've got any specific examples um, of how it's been applied and, and perhaps perhaps we'll start, I don't know if Bijou is there. So Karthik, we'll, we'll perhaps start with you again. Sure, no problem. Um, I'll, I'll con let me continue on with uh, what I said uh, previously. Uh, one is definitely in the sensors area. Um, I, I think the wireless sensor or the IIoT, uh, Industrial Internet of Things, uh, where 
that has accelerated tremendously and uh, that has actually uh, enabled folks or uh, operators like us where we can actually upgrade our system at, at a much lower cost and bring in a lot of data. So first thing is we need to bring in the data. The data is going to be the next generation. In order for us to do it and with um, previous point where Johan made us like the crude oil went negative, we, we can actually explore the money in actually going and doing an upgrade on every system. So that's the first one. Second, I would say in terms of a technology is cloud enablement. Uh, I know it's a fancy terminology um, that everybody talks about cloud. It's uh, hanging all, everybody all over everybody's head now. But um, it's, it's actually a neat way of actually bringing in the data into a centralized repository, especially if we have multiple systems, multiple network, multiple gathering systems. Uh, that's actually a huge transformation where we actually will be able to bring in a lot of return on investment. Uh, and then third, I would say, is operations. Well, either if it's a digital permit, digital rounds, or if it's a drone in Yeah, that actually adds another tremendous value where you can know there is opportunities to be looked at from a drone perspective. And then trading is another big area that's actually, like I said, it's barely, we barely scratch the surface. And uh, there's a lot coming in, especially from the financial industry where they, they're way advanced in terms of a digital transformation in FinTech. And now it's actually spilling over in oil and gas, how these Tradings are actually the lessons learned is getting applied over in our industry, and it's actually going to be a tremendous value in the. Biju, are you with us? Looks like you may have lost connection or some technology issue. So, um, Johan, the same question to uh, to you. Yeah, I want to just add to what Karthik says, same thing for us. Um, we obviously have much smaller systems, so the drone thing isn't as big a deal for us. But same on um, sensors and cloud. The um, as, a, as a small gathering company, I think for us, it's finding those sensors that are small enough and cheap enough. Quite frankly, for a small oil producer that's trucked, gathered, that has and continues to be a challenge to, I think, most equipment vendors or traditional equipment vendors in the oil and gas space are, are selling um, just larger, very good systems that just is overkill for what a guy with maybe 100 barrels a day of production is trying to do. So um, it's that, but I, I, I think looking for those cheaper sensor solutions um, is... Uh, I'm seeing some some vendors starting to look at that, but we just have in the USA, uh, just because of our legacy, so many small producers out there. So it's a huge market if we can figure out a way to cheap enough serve them. So that's one area where we're looking at technology, but what has impacted us most and continuing to impact is what um, Karthik said, the, the moving everything to the cloud and giving everybody access to the same data set. So, when I mean everybody, I'm not just talking about us. What has happened in COVID is we have sh moved how we share responsibilities between us and our customers and our vendors, where we used to maybe send somebody out, but because our customer maybe had somebody already at that site, they picked up some of what we used to do. And then putting the controls and measurement and reporting tools around that through the cloud so that somebody else's employee can actually do part of my job and reciprocating, right? Where it brings down their cost of service. And maybe I do now something like some of their reporting that they used to do. I now do that for them from our systems. And that was both on the, if you think of us as a gathering, but both picking up at the lease, the trucking system, same deal. We, we shared and shifted who does what to um, have less duplicate people in the field. And then the same on the delivery side, um, so throughout our gathering chain, we have l relied heavily on cloud-based, basically websites, right, that feeds into our system and mobile apps where 
we could move who does what very efficiently in reporting while having the security and everything around it. And then on the other side, on the development side, being uh, we, we didn't want to turn into a IT shop ourselves and hire a bunch of coders. So the platforms we have shifted to are some of these code light development systems. We certainly every now and then we reach out to a, um, uh, a development crew to help us write some crew code or we do it internally. But um, most of the time it's things that people without years and years of coding experience can do in house, change forms, adjust forms. Oh, the formula for tax on this lease has changed. Can we put that formula in? We can do all of that in house without having to have extremely advanced software skills. So, Again, the platforms we are using are those platforms that allow us to do it ourselves while at the same time having the support ready so that if we pick up the phone and say, hey, listen, this is something we can't do ourselves. Can you do it very quickly? Can they can they do some uh, development for us and having all that wrapped in a very secure system? So I'd say for us, that has been the primary area is having this easy to develop, easy to deploy, fast to change, able to share with multiple parties, cloud platform where we can gather everything from permits and field tickets to dispatch schedules to contracts to trading information and very quickly make adjustments to that. So it's the old adage that we, we that just get out of Excel. Excel is a really, really useful tool for us for reporting. So we would take something out if we need a to do something that's a different graph or a different chart or different report a customer is asking for. So that's where we come in, in, into Excel. But every time we, we, we lean and turn to Excel, we, we ask ourselves, why did we do that? Is this truly a one-time unique thing, which is good for Excel? Or is this something that's we got, that we're going to repeat? And then moving that into our, our platform and having that platform designed in a way that we don't have to spend a lot of money and time and effort externally to update it, to do what we want to, being able to do it in a very efficient, quick change way. So we can deploy new forms and things like that in, in under a week. Um, again, we are small and less people and less layers of approval. So uh, that that helps us do that. So that's been, I'd say, the, the primary. And there's a, there's a handful of systems that we evaluated over the past few years that allowed us to do that code, light, quick development, secure, shared platforms. And uh, we are very happy with uh, the people that are supporting us on that side. Fantastic. Um, did you? Sorry about that, guys. Did you, um, I'm not sure if you were, welcome back, nope. firstly. Um, Sorry about that. Were you, did, were you following the, the discussion? No, I wasn't able to actually. I wasn't okay, to. no, that's fine. Not a problem. I think. Um, so, wh why don't we move on to uh, to, the, to the next question? So, um, perhaps looking, maybe we look specifically at, at data, um, data analytics, AI, uh, machine learning, those kind of those kind of areas. So, clearly, there's there's a lot of value, um, but there's also a lot of risks attached to it as well. So, perhaps you could perhaps you could share some insights into you know, what you're doing around this area, um, what you see the risks has been, and if you've got any sort of uh, tips of how to uh, to overcome those. Okay. Um, so with BG? Sure. Uh, so I, I think that's a, that's a good topic. So a lot of, lot of um, work, I think, if anything, all this machine learning and AI has revealed is that maybe what we thought was good quality just is really good quality, and your your engines will predict depending upon you know, what you have. Um, so all the discussions over the years about data governance and quality suddenly have become real because I think it's made lots of people question, you know, where all the money was spent over the years trying to get this right because when you actually need it, now you don't have it. So that's that's one thing. So I think the fundamentals are the same when it comes to data, which is you know, where is it? What's the you know, where does it come from? You know, there's very fill, verifiable, traceable, complete notion about what data looks like. And does it have the quality that you want? Uh, so we do 
apply that. We do a lot of predictive uh, you know, analytics when it comes to assets and trying to see what that means and what, it, what does that look like based on all the other factors that are coming in. Um, so do I think that'll continue? Absolutely. Do I think there's a lot of work to be done in general about, it may not be the flashy good stuff, but to get the flashy good stuff, you gotta do all the grunt work. <laughs> you know, there's no way out of the hard work. That's, that, that'll be my tip is there's no way out of hard work. You just have to do the work. Right, if you really want the outcome, and uh, I think everybody is kind of realizing that. Uh, for us, it's been an interesting journey, only because I think when it comes to a lot of the asset and asset management and just general maturity around comes to that, we've been really good at it over the years, right? Just because that's kind of the core of the business that's there. Any projects and transformation that we do, that's always an element around, you know, what kind of data do you have and what does that look like? You know, we capture the field and so on. So, like everybody else, I think it's a progressive element in the graph. Uh, I think every time you do it, you mature it. Uh, but it is true that analytics and, and AI and machine learning will expose to organizations the, the areas that they're weak at. And what I would say is uh, get on to the work of fixing that point. Don't debate and, and stew on it. Just get on with fixing it because that delivers to an outcome. That's part one. Two, be sure about the outcome that you're looking for. I think there's lots of people who have lots of analytics and everybody wants everything, but you know, is that really integrated into your old management practice? Is that how you operate? How do you actually leverage it? I think that's the thinking that people have to do organizations versus I just feel that I need more, so I, I should have more. That's what I would say. Okay. And then yeah. is, there a particular, is there a particular area that you see AI and machine learning being more effective as in where do you see the sort of biggest ROI? Yeah, yeah I, I think, you know, in asset intensive industries, I think that's where the, the money is, right? Which is, you know, what, what assets do you have? Where are they and what's happening to them? Yeah. And the yeah. amount of, and even, look, even if you look from a regulatory perspective over the years, and actually a lot of, at least in Canada, you know, we're probably about two, three years behind. So a lot of regulatory policies kind of start in the UK, they come to the United States, then they kind of come to Canada. And if you look at regulatory bodies in general, they're asking for it asset plans and where you're going to spend the money and why you're going to spend it. It's kind of difficult to do all that in some level of guarantee if you don't actually leverage some of these new technologies that are going to tell you and the data that you need. And so I don't think that's any difference. So yeah, I, I think for asset, now if you're a customer centric company like Telco, yeah, customers are your big thing. For asset intensive industries, the assets are the big thing. So that's where I think you get the biggest ROI for sure. Yeah. Would you like to expand on any of that, Karthik? Yeah, definitely, for sure. Uh, the, the main reason is I think one thing this pandemic has brought into uh, is I, I think the terminology of AI and ML is a buzzword in a, pretty much most of the conversations that we actually run into. So uh, AI and ML is overused um, and, and technically we need to figure out what exactly do we need. So um, what we, again, there's so many technologies out there right now but as an asset intense industry uh, in general, we got to figure out what's the best ROI and how do we prioritize it. So uh, there's a lot of uh, work that's being done, but we once we bring in the data, there's a lot of data quality issues that we are discovering. It was never ever opened up for any discussion until we started bringing a flood of data. The first thing is now we started running into data quality issues. So then then now we start putting in order, how do we actually maintain our data integrity? Then you need to start having your governance. Then comes in actually truly your data analytics piece. So especially if you have a multiple, like, like our industry where you have assets spread across the geography, sometimes between two different, uh, uh, Canada and in US and also to Mexico, if it's spread across, it's a, it's extremely intense to do analytics. And for that, your data quality is extremely important. So for that purpose, now there's actually more tools out there that just focuses on data quality. So uh, just as an example, in in one small section of our midstream, you, you probably get over 20,000 data points. And looking at that data point is Great and doing an analytics work is fantastic, but if your data quality is up for question and discussion, I think that 
that negates every work that we are running into. So the more we actually advance, the more we actually have to keep taking a step back and then keep going forward. So it's like two step forward, one step backwards, like, okay, I want to do data analytics. I want to go into a predictive engine. Oh, by the way, my data is actually not that great. Let me go back, build my data quality, then move forward. So that's kind of a challenge that we run into now. And 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 quite honestly, when these machines were rolled out for data gathering, it was never looked at from a data quality perspective or sampling that what we are looking for right now to actually build that analytics. So it's kind of a, a world that where we are actually accelerating so fast, but we got to live with our legacies, but then we got to pull everything together. Anything you'd like to add, Johan? I just said that like Gothic and Vijay said, the whole term AI, I think, is completely overused for anything that you plug into a wall. Um, so the true AI, which I view as you're training some brain to make decisions that you don't really understand how it's making decisions, right? Like you changing a puppy or a child or something. We, we don't really use much. Um, the only place we have touched that true machine learning AI space is in some data analytics, we've, we've got a great um, lead data analyst and Jeff Whitting who, who helps us project in a field drilling plans and water cuts and oil cuts and um, gas cuts. And he, he started to play with some of those things, right? And, and trying to run backward models and seeing what we thought would happen. But really that is the only place we've touched anything that I would call AI. Um, all of the rest of it is just good old data analytics, gathering data and running it through formulas versus running it through big blue that is doing something mysterious to it that you don't understand. So um, again, that's the whole AI machine learning thing. So we don't touch it we, we much other than when we get adventurous and saying, how can we predict how much gas is gonna come out of this field and um, running 5,000 wells profiles historically. And so that's really the only, only place we've touched, true machine learning or AI. Um, I think some of our vendors um, that we use systems for certainly use it for things like OCR, um, optical character recognition and things like that. When we take in contracts and digitize them, there's somewhere there's AI most likely happening, but it's not us doing it, right? It's, it's somebody that provides a service to us. Um, but the other part of it, there's so much just to do with good old data sets and formulas. I wouldn't call that AI, I just call that data analytics. And that's really where we've tried to excel and then using systems to share that broadly across our organization and our vendors and our customers um, and our partners. Um, in a very efficient, as close to real time as we get. That, that's where we've really seen the automation and technology benefit versus the, like I said, deep think, or what was the guy from uh, Hitchhiker's Guide in the Galaxy? Uh, we, we haven't really done anything like that. And I think you have to tie it to outcomes too, right? So I think it's like technology fit for purpose, versus it just sounds good. And you, not everybody has to be in AI, it's okay. As long as you're kind of driving your business performance, you're kind of being competitive in landscape that you want to win in, it's all good, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not like it's a requirement that everybody has to embrace this thing more because eventually it's going to come. They'll integrate your products and services. And we'll all be faced with it. And I think it's really, uh, to, to Johan's point, I agree. I think a lot of this work is this flame old like data analytics work and it's hard work and, you know, get to governance that actually makes things happen versus have a thousand questions every time you find data anomalies. You're like, well, how could it have been? Why did it happen? That, that's not going to move you forward. What's going to move you forward is you find an anomaly, you kind of say, well, let's get on with trying to figure out what it is and how we fix it so we can get an outcome that we want versus live in historical context that actually doesn't get you anywhere except exactly where you are. That's what I would say. And organizations really focus on that. Like, how do you make progress? like right away versus pontificate about how the universe could have been better had you done something five years ago. Like it just doesn't matter anymore, right? I, I think I will, I, I will add to it. I, I think 
the data analytics piece and the AI and machine learning, like you, you both summarized, um, Biju and Johannes, it's it's there. But the ultimate goal is optimization. What, what, how are we trying to optimize our our system? Like a system optimization are, is what we are looking at. If we can achieve it without an AI, sure, great. Like if we if AI is going to add value, then let's see, okay, what's the dollar per barrel we are going to make if we put in this specific AI? At, at the end of the day, it all comes down to that. Um, it's If we use AI and get the additional dollar per barrel, yeah, everybody would be excited. But if we don't get that and we can achieve the same system optimization without an, any AI and ML, I think that's actually even, that's a better way to run the pipeline. But I think, unfortunately, AI and ML is actually kicking us up in that area. But I think it's definitely an area to get in, but the goal is system optimization, how we are driving that. That's a good point. Very good point. We, we have about, about 12 minutes left to the session, um, and I've got several questions left. So I think um, just a reminder to the audience, if you want to ask the panel any questions, drop it in the Q&A box. Um, I think I'll select, uh, I think I'll select a, a couple of the um, important ones. So, uh, one of them is around um, wearables, um, AR, VR, and things like that. So I guess the same question applies um, in terms of AI. Um, yeah, how do you see how do you see virtual reality, wearables, and, and those kind of types of technology impacting the sector and and and, and driving optimization? Yeah, I've seen. I like the probably the easiest use cases I've seen is around training for uh, VR and AR. Like I can see, and there's firms out there kind of gone down that path. And, you know, the, the amount of work and just kind of like, we have lots of, you know, uh, they're not fake, but I, I like as built areas where people go and technicians go and they train. And so, you know, there's a subdivision that was actually there. So we, we do a lot of work in training, we usually keep people updated and so on. I can see elements of that kind of moving to this VR, VR kind of a model uh, where it may make it easier, kind of more on demand. Uh, for this sector, that's that's where I see. I, it's mostly like field related stuff, right? And that's only just to ramp people up, not so much of operational things per se. Um, there, there are other use cases that are emerging. Would you think it's all there right now? I don't think so. I think the training use case may be sooner than later. But other than that, I think it's going to take probably another four or five years away. That's my sense, but others can have a yeah, problem. Yeah, I, I got a, a, we actually experimented with these technologies. So we actually ran a couple of use cases, but not in the midstream area, but in a downstream area. Um, here's my take on uh, virtual reality. If we have to get the next generation, younger generation into this industry, we need to give them the video game. Those kids, uh, the, they, the generation is, they grew up in cell phones. They, they play games all day in and out. And, and we need to give them, we don't need to give them a checklist, say you need to follow step one, step two, step three. Give them the virtual reality. Okay, this is how you go. You move your palm. This is what you do. We got to give them the virtual reality. I, I think that's that attracts the next generation. And that's that's something desperately that, the energy industry or the oil and gas industry need uh, to actually attract the next gen. So that this is my personal take is just because the uh, next generation is growing up in a different uh, environment where cell phones are like notebooks and that's what they use every day. And that's a, like they use that for classrooms today. And that is absolutely essential when we come and ask them to take a training class and say, hey, okay, follow step one to 36 and that's just put them right to sleep so uh, versus get them a virtual reality training program that actually gets the excitement and i quite honestly there are other industries that have actually looked into it and are actually embarking on it and our industry is getting there and as we all know our industry is slowly making the changes and uh, this is going to be an area at some point, it's going to, and it needs to be, uh, again, comes down to the ROI. If it's just changing 36 steps into uh, to, to uh, dynamic virtual reality, 
but the ROI is not there, then that's going to be a challenge for an asset intent. So what, what do you think? What do you think is going to stop it? I mean, if it's if it's still a few years away, but you see it as an important part um, for the future of uh, of the industry. Um, what do you think is going to stop it from accelerating and moving forward quicker? Uh, it, it's the culture. Like so, the oil and gas industry is not. It's not an industry where we are proactive in adopting technologies. We have been. We and in the change curve and the adoption in the technology. If you look at it, oil and gas have always adopted technology that's already well proven, well established. Then we actually adopt the technology. Virtual reality is up and coming technology. It's it's not it's not past that mature hype curve, uh, the Gartner curve that they put out. It's still in that hype curve. So to get past that, the culture change is like this is how I've done it for 20 years, and then you got a new workforce uh, coming in and training them. That's going to be the cultural change. So that's the biggest challenge we see. Second one we see is um, like I said, the ROI. Why? What is it? bring to us okay I can go from paper to digital what value can we clearly articulate in terms of an ROI that's going to be the biggest change um, in in our in, in I think many industries the same but especially oil and gas industry uh, having I, I think sharing the same with Biju and Johan been in this for the last two decades if you don't provide a good robust ROI I, I think it's just a noise so that's the that's been a challenge so far. And the last one I would say is merging a technology of a past or an obsolescence to a technology of the future. So bringing in a virtual reality to, an, to a, a site where you have antique equipments or obsolete equipment that was installed in 80s or 70s or even, I don't know, God knows when. So that's, that's the challenge that you run into. So I would say these are the three challenges you run into. In my, Johan, would you like to expand on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think for us, small startup company ROI is everything, and we just haven't seen it on the VR side. I, I think places where I may see it in the future is, for example, when we design a gathering system, we throw some lines on a map and then try to visualize that pipe very quickly and efficiently before we go out and get a full on system design going so an area like that maybe a vr application would be nice but how much of an roi is that versus just looking at a screen and scrolling it around right like am i really gonna get the roi benefit between the two the same with some um data analytics we do right when you're visualizing a field and trying to look at hot spots of production future estimates of I could see a nice virtual reality situation where I can look through that field and look at the production and visualize it different ways. But again, how much of an ROI is that versus just looking at it on a screen? So um, we have seen some very nice um, kind of three-dimensional presentations of facility mock-ups and things like that. And, but um, again, how who benefits? Again, I go to dollars, right? Who benefits how many dollars by looking at that with a headset versus on a screen for us as a small startup company? So I think the use case is different where you're in a massively complicated thing and you need to zoom up. But for us, that's outsourcing most of those kind of things. I just haven't seen a, 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 a virtual reality ROI versus just looking at it on a screen. Now, when you talk about wearables, um, this thing we all have in our pocket, the iPhone, that's the <laughs> ultimate wearable and we're levering, leveraging the daylights out of it. Um, I don't have an app yet on an Apple Watch. I haven't seen the ROI on that versus on uh, just your iPhone, but I think people forget that a, a phone in your pocket is also wearable and it's, mm -hmm. it's really providing massive returns for us moving data collection points into the field and taking pictures and having real time back and forth discussions about problem areas. So that would be um, just as a small startup, we just haven't seen the return yet. I would say there's, there's a case for augmented reality, especially when it comes to the days when I was writing one call systems where you go and 
somebody wants to dig something and you know, call in and say, I'm going to dig here, and then somebody clears it because of. I think cases like that, I can see. In, in our case, like we actually do locate, we go out, if somebody's doing construction, we check it out, make sure we're not going to hit in gas lines. There is a case for augmented reality there instead of carrying a whole bunch of records along with you, that if you could do that where it's add on to the landscape that you're looking for so that you can see what the assets are and where they are, I think there's a case there you could probably make for sure. Uh, and there are a couple of companies I know who do that kind of work. It's just the massive amounts of geographic data and mapping information that you have to carry. You know, but you can, there are apps today, right? You can point to the sky and tell you what the constellation looks like. So I'm sure we can master the, the art of putting assets on the ground and the phone so you can, when you point to a house, it kind of tells you what's under it or around it. Uh, and here it's a lot. Like if you're, it's, yeah, you have to call in if you're going to do any digs because you can hit a gas line and you can create an explosion. Yeah. Google, Google Maps with a good game Z file does a lot for us. There you go. On an iPad in the field. Yeah, and there, there are lots of options. I think that's the beauty of it is there's so many different options out there today for companies who want to explore it. So I think the how is not the issue anymore. I don't think. I think it's always the what and why. I mean, you know, I'm probably exactly right. If you get the what and why, then it's a function of time, money, and people. Like, that's it. There, there's nothing I think today you cannot do in that context. So we have, we have one minute left. Um, and we do have a question from the audience. So we don't have time for everybody to respond. So I don't know who would like to, uh, to answer this question. But um, the question, well, the, the, basically, I'll read it out. So question is, does the panel think that data preparation will become its own procurement line item or will it always live within data analytics as ML and AIs never talked about sibling? Hmm. Very good question. Uh, I, I think that's that's fair i think there's enough there and enough work there that i think you'll be seen as separate you may look at i know i know companies and we've done this in large transformation where we take what people process technology we've had a strategy and we've added data to the whole thing so it's no longer i think that's a that, that three words i think of a very kind of a a very narrow view of what transformation looks like i think it's broader than that and it's, it's broader than that people don't talk about the, the cousin because it's hard work. Like nobody wants to talk about the hard work. Data is hard work. You know, keep it clean, keep it make sure that people follow an enabling system so that there's discipline that's enforced. It's all hard work. So yeah, I think so. I think that'll happen. It's not already. Others can comment for sure. Okay, good. Well, I think um, we're out of time now. So I think that will conclude the session. Um, great, great session, by the way, guys. I think um, it's a shame that we didn't quite get to go through all of the questions. Um, I feel like you guys could talk about this for days, uh, which is a good thing. It shows how passionate you are. Um, but for the purpose of time, um, unfortunately, we can't do that. So um, I'd just like to conclude by thanking each, each of you. Um, you. Karthik, Bijou, Johan, really appreciate you taking the time to, to spend sharing your insights with the audience. Um, very much appreciated. I, I genuinely hope that we get to do this again in the future and uh, I hope we get to do it in person as well. So thank you very much once again and um, we'll now conclude the session and we'll be back into the next session in just a few moments. <laughs>